Hello, and welcome back to the Book Marketing Tips and Author Success Podcast. This is Penny Sansevieri with Amy Cornell. I have to tell y'all, I'm so I'm so excited. I always sound. This is just how I am naturally. Just, just so y'all know, I'm always excited about all the things. Just ask Amy. Um, we got. I got a message um, on Instagram from a listener who was talking about our podcast, and we got a comment on one of our podcast show links on our, on my Instagram page about how much y'all love in this podcast. And I got to tell you, makes us so happy. I always, if Amy doesn't see them first, um, I always screenshot them and send them to her and we, we get all giddy and excited about those. So we thank you all so much for your feedback and we have, we're, we're getting more reviews. So that's really fabulous. I love that. Um, I love that we are um, really, it seems to be like we're really striking a chord with people. Would you agree? Oh yeah. That's, that's, I love that kind of feedback, especially. And I appreciate those of you that even write us directly or that write Penny directly and let us know where you're at with the show. There was another message you got recently, Penny, where somebody explained that they were, they were working on an upcoming release or something like that. So they were digging into very specific episodes and it was really helping them. And that was amazing to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So we really appreciate it. And, and this episode, and I'm going to let Amy do the introduction on this episode in particular, but this episode, as are many of our episodes, as you all know, if you've listened for a while, was born out of a question or a concern or an issue that a lot of authors face. Amy, do you want to give us the lead in on this? Yeah, absolutely. So we want to talk about when an author has a lot of books and they love the writing process, but they don't love the marketing. And it's not an uncommon problem in publishing. You know, you want to focus on the writing and the releasing of the books and getting more books out because that's the fun part. That's the creative part. That's why you got into this. That's why you're an author. You know, you didn't become an author because you love marketing. That's usually not the direction most people go in. That's but, a very good point. Yeah, but when you neglect to establish a marketing plan or work on building your platform and establishing a brand, after a while, a lot of authors realize that those are the key elements that actually support getting books in front of people. And right. that kind of exposure is what ends up generating sales and positive word of mouth. So they really do go hand in hand. And eventually that light bulb kind of goes off for a lot of authors once they have a backlist and then they go, my backlist isn't supporting my writing career as the way I thought it would. So in a way, and I have children, so this is why this, this particular analogy came to me, but in a way it's kind of like having a few kids before you realize how much time and money it takes to care for them properly and adequately. Like after a while it sinks in, you go, wow, these kids are expensive and they're a lot of work, you know? <laughs> and I feel like that's how people start feeling about their books once they realize that that marketing and that branding really is a pretty big requirement if you do want to eventually start making some money back. Yeah, yeah, I know. And that is, that is a really good analogy. And it is, you know, it's so, it's so funny what you've let in with we don't get into this industry because we love marketing. That is such a true statement. I feel like that should be on a bumper sticker or a t-shirt or something. Um, <laughs> That'd be good. Or like one of those damn it dolls that you get a slam against the wall. <laughs> Do you know, that's so funny. Um, I, I sent Amy a damn it doll. I don't even know if you still have it, but, and this isn't a test. Like you don't have to show it to, you don't have to turn on your video camera and show it to me. But I sent her a damn, I sent her a damn it doll. I feel like every author needs to have one of those. The moment that you realize that your books don't market themselves, you can just hit that damn it doll and just, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe we have our Christmas presents figured out now. <laughs> I, I should start, I should start giving those away at events and and um with and branding a branding a damn it doll to author marketing experts. I don't know if that's such a great branding idea. <laughs> I guess like, slam us against the wall. I know, right? Here, I love these girls from Author Marketing the Expert. Bam! Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll maybe we'll figure out something else. But it does happen a lot. So you know, you get so caught up in the writing, and you're like, oh, I want to keep writing. I want to keep writing because that's. And I am a writer. I get it. That is the creative 
piece of this, right, is you want to keep writing. The only thing that reigns me in is the fact that I've like, I've seen Oz behind the curtain and I get it. You know, I can't, he, I can't write, like, I, I also want to write across different genres. Like, oh, I want to write this. I want to write that. Oh, that would be a really good story. And I had this, I walked around in my, uh, for weeks with this great mystery story in my head, right? That I won't mm-hmm. waste the time on the podcast telling you, even though I really want to. Um, but I'm like... <laughs> I have no time to market that book. I mean, it would be fun to get it out there. It's like, oh, but you tell your story. That's awesome. But literally with 8,200 books published every day, nobody's going to read the story if I don't market it. Um, So when I get on the phone with authors and they say, okay, so, and I do this a lot. I get this a lot, both on first calls, but also in coaching. And they'll say to me, I have a lot of books out. I don't know what to focus on. And When they have a lot of books out, a lot of times the scenario is that they've either written in different genres. So they might have children's books. They might have, you know, nonfiction or genre fiction. Maybe they have a couple of series that they've written in. And I will tell them that your book, first and foremost, your book or your books or your series will tell you what to focus on. And I'm not saying that this is like some sort of psychic connection to your books or anything. This The show didn't just all of a sudden get super weird, but it's about the, the number of reviews and the sales. And you may say to me, well, Penny, I'm not making that many sales, but you par- probably are selling some books. And typically that's where you want to turn, where you want to lean into that's that's what you want to focus on not telling you to kill off the rest of all of like all of your other 27 books slash children to use amy's analogy now the show just got super (laughs) weird now it did get dark (laughs) now it gets so dark but um focusing starting there that is the first place that you want to start and once you've identified that then and we're going to talk about some other things that you could implement across all of your titles, then you can start to expand out and revitalize your, your brand and your library. I mean, Amy, what? Yeah, it's a really, it's, it's a real Sophie's choice sort of a situation. Again, ah, we're, we're in a theme. <laughs> we've got the theme now, but really you have to start somewhere. We realize some of you listening may have quite a backlist. So and we're not just throwing everything at you, like make it all work, fix everything. Start yeah. with, like Penny said, with your book that has the most promise and work from there. But the first thing you have to do is create a marketing plan that you're committed to sticking to. Because again, we realize that is the harder part. You're sitting here listening. And if this resonates with you, it's not that you don't know you have to market your books. You just don't want to. And we get it. <laughs> like, yeah. So create a marketing plan that you can stick to. Even if that is just one or two things you're doing a month, that's one or two more things than you were doing last month. We have our free monthly planner that you can download. We'll be sure to put a link in the notes, but figure out what you can do consistently and specifically to get your book in front of more people. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can do for marketing and they all play off of each other and support each other in different ways and different channels and platforms you can use. And they kind of all work in unique ways, but focus on just getting it in front of more people, you know, start with what you can manage even begrudgingly and then build from there. But the consistency is what's important. So again, one or two things a month that you weren't doing previously is actually going to help. Yeah, exactly. Now the other piece, and this is, but another tough conversation to have is that if you have written books in different genres, so you've written nonfiction, let's say, and you've written children's books, or you've written nonfiction and contemporary romance or something like that, it's, it is a completely different set of rules for each book. So most people, most readers don't genre hop, right? Um, Every, you know, if you've written across different genres, each of those is a separate brand, unfortunately. Now, there are ways that you could, and this gets a little bit too far in the weeds, so I don't want to get into this too much. There are authors that we have worked with that work across different genres, that market across different genres, and keep it all under one umbrella. But 
there is no reader crossover in most cases because readers do not genre hop. I mean, Amy, and I, am I making, I feel like I'm not making sense. Am I making sense? No, I, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, we heard this at a, it was an RWA conference. It oh, was, yes, that's right. It was an indie author and it was one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. And I've repeated it over and over again. I wish I remembered who it was because she, I, I should credit her, but she said, and you can't sell a cat to a dog person. Right. And it's so true. And you can waste a lot of time and money trying to take the shortcut and just assume that marketing one way is going to sell all your books to all the people. But that's really just not going to work. And you're just going to waste more time waiting for something to happen that's realistically never going to happen. So you really do need to have separate marketing plans for each genre or market that you are trying to appeal to. And it doesn't mean, I mean, Penny and I could, you know, we'll sit here and tell you that doesn't mean that you can't use similar strategies in different markets and genres, but you, you know what I mean? But those efforts still have to be different. They have to be very intentional for each book. So doing a limited time discount for your children's book is not going to bring any attention to your nonfiction title is what we're saying. So they really have to have their own marketing plan and their own efforts. Right, right, exactly. And in some cases, they may you may they may have to have their own um, website too, mm -hmm. because you know, and that gets to be a little bit tough. So the next piece is um, you're going to have to clean house. And I know I hesitated before I started saying this. <laughs> Um, that, that was kind of perfect. <laughs> well, because I think that you're really going to have to look at things with a critical eye, right? You're going to have to look at your brand. You're going to have to look at your book covers. Are they dated? Especially if you've written in, you know, if you've been writing a lot of books, you've just been pumping them out and putting them out. You're probably, you're probably, your covers could probably do with a refresh, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, when you are, when you're at this crossroads and you think I've, you know, now I really need to focus on marketing. So the good news that I, I want to share with you before we dig in more into the cleaning house part of it is that if you've written a lot of books already, you really are in a very unique position to speed up the process to a certain extent, right? And it does depend a little bit on the genre that you've written. And like, for example, genre fiction, these re you know readers tend to be voracious. They like multiple authors with multiple books, things like that. Um, nonfiction kind of sort of the same way. I think memoirs, a lot, I mean, I don't know how many people write multiple books on memoir unless you've had quite the life, right? <laughs> um, but when we talk about cleaning house, we, we talk about, you know, your brand, what your website looks like, um, what your setup on, you know, what your Amazon book page looks like, are your, I mentioned, are your covers outdated? There, you need to to look at this with an eye of professionalism that maybe you hadn't considered previously. I mean, I think you know we all like I can look back on some of my older book covers. Nick Law, there was a time, there was a point in time when I really liked that cover. Mm -hmm. Now I look at it and I'm like, oh dear God, how do I like pull this off of Amazon because it looks hideous? Because tastes evolve and brands evolve and covers evolve, especially in genre fiction, right? Because there was a time when, you know, there was uh, genre fiction in particular has sort of phases, kind of like when we all wore micro mini skirts. Well, not me, but some people, I hear tell some people did. Um, it, was a thing. it was a thing. Yeah, it was absolutely a thing. But I think, you know, getting in there and really cleaning house and you, you can certainly focus on the book or the series that's doing the best and start with that one, or you can just start from the ground up. Yeah, I agree with you, Penny, because I, it, this is very normal. So nobody should feel bad if they have a few covers that are not up to snuff anymore. So because normal. Yeah. It takes a while to find a good cover designer sometimes too. Oh yeah. So if you have multiple books out there, you might be on your third or fourth cover designer and you're finally found somebody that does great work. It matches your brand. It's great for the genre, all these things, but you weren't working with that person when you first were releasing. So it really does make a big difference to work with somebody that you trust now that's doing good work to go back and see what they can do about revamping. It's, it's yeah. a brilliant idea and it's a relatively simple way to really refresh an old book too. And we've done multiple shows on that. So 
Well, and if I can, if I can just sort of interject, I mean, by full disclosure, I, as you all know, I'm re-releasing um, the truckload book, which has been renamed. And I don't know if we've officially announced the name yet, so I won't mention it yet on the podcast, but um, I had a devil of a time finding a cover person because we, you know, you want somebody that you, you, when you look, when you're, when you're looking for a cover designer, you want somebody that you feel kind of matches your vibe to a, to an extent. Right. And covers, like we said, covers evolve over time. So it's a process. Yeah, it really is. And in your case, Penny, you serve a very specific market and yeah. sometimes it takes a long time to find a cover designer that has a portfolio that you can confidently say like, okay, this person will understand what I need versus, right. you know, they've done some great covers, but they're th- these books, even when they're nonfiction are very different from my market, what I need to convey. And that's a gamble just assuming that that person's going to know what to do with your book. So we get it. It's not easy, but when you find the right person, use them across the board. Right. Exactly. Definitely. And we're talking about refreshing. So I have to mention descriptions too. Descriptions are huge. I realize that's another element that kind of, by the time you're ready to get your book up, I think a lot of times descriptions don't get the attention they deserve because you've put in a lot of time and energy to finally get that book up on Amazon and up for sale. We get it but they really do make a huge difference in converting shoppers to actual buyers. So as part of your cleanup, get some impartial feedback and some professional feedback, you know, on, on what, how your book description comes across, because again, get other people. If you know, other authors, have them read it, ask your network, have them read it, and then ask a professional you know, ask somebody in marketing, do some coaching, do some consulting and, you know, kind of use all that input to figure out what really works and read descriptions of bestsellers that you're trying to compete with too. That'll also tell you what people are being drawn to, you know, that that's a, that's another great way to kind of find out what's working in the market. You know, what are shoppers looking for? What do they want to read when it comes to a book description that helps them choose to buy. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that, that's exactly right. And it is, um, book descriptions like anything else evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, I wanted to say, I think we did a show on, I don't remember when it was, but I think we did a show on elevator pitches. I really recommend, even if, you know, you don't have a lot of books out, you just have one that you you think, Oh, i I want to use some of these tips and revitalize that. Go back through that episode and listen to some of the tips about whittling down and refining your book description because I think it'll be yeah, it'll be really, really helpful for you. Um, but I love the getting the impartial feedback on book descriptions because I think yeah. that's, that is part of the idea. The other thing that I wanted to mention here too is that if you have, so, you know, kind of sort of sit with yourself and um, think back to, any of the pushback that you got on your books. So let's say that you did send them out for review or you sent them out to bloggers or whatever, and you got some feedback on them, right? Think back to any of the less than positive feedback that you got that might be helpful as you are cleaning house, as you are revamping. So reviewers, you we can learn a lot from negative reviews and we've done shows on negative reviews before. Nobody, including myself, is a fan of negative reviews, but they can teach us a lot about what may need to be, what might need to be fixed, Mm -hmm. right? So go back through, if you did do some marketing on your book, you set it out, or maybe you heard over and over again that, oh, I thought this book was, you know, X, Y, Z. I thought this book was, is a telltale sign that it's probably not in the right genre. So we haven't really talked about the genre straddling thing too, is that if you are going to clean house and you're going to look at your platform and all of the things, book covers and your book descriptions, make sure that you're in the right genre. I know this sounds crazy, right? But genres it, you change, do change over time. I mean, we have some standard genres that will always stay with us always, always, always. But 15 years ago, like we didn't have holiday romance as right. a genre on Amazon, you know what I mean? So 
genres now we have now there's genres for you know art books on artificial intelligence we didn't have that 10 years ago do you know what i mean so think about whether or not your book needs to be in a different genre because that could be what is holding everything back for you too and yeah. shows on you know picking the right genre i don't remember when we did them i, I should have this library in my head but um but yeah, we've done shows on, you know, authors who are in the wrong genre and switching can make all the difference in the world. It does make a huge difference. I agree. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's a big project. So, you know, you, as Amy said, get the, you know, get your planner out and kind of figure, um, I really recommend if you're at this point in your career, hold off releasing any other books until you can figure out where you're at or get lined up or sit with a professional or, you know, I, and this is not a push for coaching, but, but I love to spend time on the phone with authors doing coaching about this. Just get a really clear path before you release your next book. Yeah. We had an author, we were connected to an author very recently, just this week, who is kind of dealing with this that said, I know I need to get things into gear before the next step. And it was refreshing to hear an author say that, you know, versus just pushing through. She realized there are things she can do better and it's only going to help her in the future by focusing on what hasn't gone right to date and fixing it. And that's, that's amazing. That that's a huge breakthrough, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is a huge break breakthrough. Um, Amy, do you want to close this out? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I hope this was helpful. Again, we hear this problem a lot. So if you're resonating with this at all, whether you have 10 books or two books, you are not alone. You know, each book really is like a child in that <laughs> they really are. They're unique. They require their own TLC. It, it, they are different animals. What's also great is that with each new one, you can do it better than the last time. <laughs> But releasing another book without a marketing plan or under your brand umbrella when it's not optimized to really attract readers and convert sales is really just piling more problems onto your plate. So, so if you're kind of thinking this might be me, do yourself a favor, pick a book like Penny said, do some house cleaning, kind of really focus again. And then we assure you your next release is going to feel a lot more successful and actually will be a lot more successful for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love to hear from reader, from listeners, um, show ideas, feedback on the show, reviews. We love reviews. I know I always ask for those, but we appreciate any and all feedback and we look forward to um, sharing some ideas on our next show. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.